All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Good, Nathan. How are you? I'm doing good, and we've got a return guest today that I'm super excited about. Yes, our returning champion is copywriter Doug Pugh. He was kind enough to be a guest a couple months ago when he talked about the music of copywriting, and Doug's currently working on a couple of books about copywriting. But that's not why he's here today. The reason Doug agreed to come on and speak is the Copywriters Podcast itself. See, Doug found himself in a bind a few weeks ago, the kind of bind that every copywriter both dreams of and cowers from, dreads, an onslaught of work no normal human could possibly handle, including insane deadlines, Plus, regular life carrying on a pace. You know, five kids, a wife, a dad who lives nearby, all those things. Did Doug survive it? We'll leave you in suspense to let Doug tell you the story. But I find what's most interesting about that week is not the sheer numbers of words, emails, pages of sales letters, etc. that Doug produced in a stunningly short period of time. What's most interesting is how he did it and how we at the Copywriters Podcast were able to help. In the same way, I hope we can help you in the future, and we'll get to the details in a minute and 25 seconds um, from when I finish this explanation, because there's something you've grown familiar hearing at the beginning of every podcast. Well, the last time he was on, I think, Doug threatened to put that to music. And never in my life did I think an award-winning composer whose work has been performed at Carnegie Hall and the Kennedy Center would compose a tune for the Copywriters Podcast. But here it is. Take it away, Doug. Doug, thank you. Wow. I take a bow. I take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. So wonderful. Now, time is of the essence, so please tell us what you're up to and about your trials and tribulations and how the Copywriters Podcast came to the rescue. Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me back, and thanks for saving my bacon a couple of weeks ago. My goodness. So let's see. Two and a half weeks ago, we had a bit of a struggle at our house. Uh, my wife, unfortunately, had a miscarriage, and we were kind of down in the dumps, you know. And uh, a couple days after that, I got a call from my mentor, Ray Edwards, with sort of a rush job. He had some emails he wanted me to throw together, uh, needed to be done in three or four days, seven emails for um, a relaunching of one of his courses. So I thought, you know what, this is just the thing to get me kind of out of the gloom, get some work, get my head in the game. So I said, yes. I spent the weekend doing some research, just going through the, 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 the product again, you know, doing the kind of the basic get to know the research. And while I was doing that, 
I was listening, re-listening, like for the third or fourth time, to some of your excellent podcast episodes, David. And I think I told you of the the funny one that happened on Sunday. I was getting ready for church. I was in the shower, and I had my my boom speaker on, whatever it's called, my Bluetooth, listening to one of the podcasts. And all these ideas just kept coming to my mind, being in the moment of needing to write copy fast and hearing your suggestions. So I had to like keep hopping out of the shower and <laughs> typing stuff on my phone and <laughs> hopping back in. And I hope my phone's okay. It should, it should be all right. But <sighs> I hope you got clean too. I did. I did get clean. Sorry for the, the mental image, but uh, we're storytellers, right? <laughs> I can't unsee it now. No. Oh, dang it. <laughs> well, I won't put that to music. <clears throat> so the what was funny was I, so I got to church and I'm sitting there in Sunday school and I start getting these frantic texts, texts from Ray's operations manager. She's like, Ray has got this terrible toothache. He was supposed to write us a whole truckload of emails today because we're having these two internal launches this coming week, one for our big certification program and the other one for our um, another course of ours. He's not going to be able to do it. He's got to go to like the dentist and get it. I don't know if he had a tooth pulled or what, but he was in bad shape. So I said, okay, I, I can do it. And they're like, well, we need them really quick. It's like, okay. So I, I felt confident enough about it. So I said, yes, there was seven emails for each internal launch. So 14 more emails. But as we talked, uh, we decided to more than double that. It ended up being 16 emails per launch. We did sort of the two a day during the five day period. And then we did four on the the closing cart day. And then we did four more emails after the close of cart as kind of like a down sell. Like you missed it, but you could still get this for another four days. Okay. So I'm, I'm tracking this. We're up to 39 emails now. Yeah. 39, 16. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yes. Thank you. Um, So yeah, then, (laughs) Then the avalanche came. I thought I was already in deep, but then Monday morning, the, I got another text frantically from the same operations manager. She said, you know what? The sales page for this certification program, I threw it together. It's not very good. And it didn't really convert last time. Is there any chance you could hurry and write an entire new sales letter for the certification program and have it to me by Wednesday? which was two days away. Um, My first reaction was no way. (laughs) But then I thought, actually I thought of one of my favorite um, uh, musicians, Leonard Bernstein, who was the associate, he was the assistant conductor at the New York Philharmonic when he was 25 years old. And this big famous guy was the main conductor. And one night the conductor got super ill and couldn't go on. And they said, okay, Bernstein, you're on. Luckily, he had been studying his scores. He knew the music cold, and he went on. That was his first big performance. And a year later, he was the director of the New York Phil, and he started this amazing career. So it's like, wow, maybe this isn't such a bad thing. Maybe this is an opportunity I should really jump on. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my wife and my kids, and I said, guys, I really feel like I need to do this, but that means I'm not going to be available like almost at all for the next couple of days. So they agreed. I went to work. Uh, But before I started working, I remembered all these Garfinkel podcasts that I had just listened to, including the one on Sunday, hopping out of the shower, that were reminding me how to get all this work done so quickly. Uh, Let's see. I think I number. So episode 32, how to cut your writing time in half. That one did huge things for me. You have these five steps. Uh, first, the research. Second, write your offer. Third, write your bullets. Fourth, outline your copy. And then fifth, don't write your copy, but assemble your copy, which you got into in episode 99, which was the shower scene. Uh, that was my shower scene, episode 99 with Gene Schwartz. Not that I was in the shower with Gene, but you get the idea. Starting um, to feel like Alfred Hitchcock in Psycho. But go <laughs> re, re, re. <laughs> yeah, it was some Bernard Herrmann music in the background. Um, so that one was immensely helpful because I wasn't sure where to start, but I just decided to trust Master Garfinkel and did it in order, and it helped, it helped a ton. It worked. It, it, it did. Worked. It, it really worked. And 
what helped um, was the, I'm writing a book with Ray right now that's going to lead to the certification program. So I had been in the research mode for a few weeks before that, and I had done a bunch of research, but I didn't, I hadn't done it with the immediacy of needing to write copy like this minute. So I went back to the research. I suddenly did a couple of really intense additional hours of research. Then I was ready to get the offer rewritten. And then I punched out, gosh, I must've done 150 or more bullets. And I didn't keep them all, but I, I found some really good ones. I think about 40 of them or so ended up in the copy. Um, anyway, so the, the other episode was episode 66, Copywriting When It's Crunch Time. And I had also just listened to that one, and I went back and you talk about um, prepare, how to prepare for crunch time, like drilling the basics on a daily basis, getting into routines and systems with your copy, and then purposefully uh, giving yourself tasks to write copy quickly, like to just practice the task of getting it out quick. And so when I had heard that the first time, it was very much like, piano lessons to me it was like oh i just i just have to know how to do this so that if i end up writing a song for david garfinkel one night i can just <laughs> pop it out right and you did well and i did you wrote the music anyway that that's incredible music by the way i i, I couldn't believe it i was like i i was speechless which as you can imagine is very unusual <laughs> when i heard it um it, it's so good and uh um, you even had to learn something new. You had to, you had to figure out how to put it in GarageBand. You hadn't really, in order to send it to me to, to polish it up a little bit. Yep. Yes. I'm very much an old school composer, pen and pa uh, paper and pencil, and I can use notation software, but logic and GarageBand and all that was like, I've never done that, but I learned a little something and you helped me. So that was great. But it was, it was getting back into that kind of, uh, preparing the muscle memory to be able to write, whether it was music or copy. It was the very same place in my mind of having, I've, I've done drills and drills and drills for my entire life, 35 years or plus of drilling chords and notes and music. And now I've been starting to do that with drilling copy, drilling headlines and hooks and bullets and offers and closes and all those kinds of things. And that really helped me. A few, actually, I just thought of another podcast episode you did a few months ago where you talked about picking something that you're weak on and taking a month and like focusing on that and do a little something every day. Like let's say it's headlines you need to work on mm -hmm. every day, read some good headlines and write some good headlines and just get into this kind of muscle memory. It was very much me relying upon the muscle memory I had been okay. working on. So you were prepared as well. I mean, you definitely needed to kick things into a higher gear and, learn or start doing for the first time some new stuff when this happened, but you were prepared. You'd been doing some things beforehand because maybe you didn't know consciously, but I guess all of us know some, you know, deep part of ourselves inside that someday crunch time's going to come and it's going to be do or die time. Really? Truly. Yeah. When the opportunity comes, am I going to be able to rise to the occasion or not? Might as well put in some effort every day to build this, long kind of mastery skill it's like the erickson example of the ten thousand hours with the violin like it just takes mm -hmm. that long my wife's a professional violinist so that's a very kind of relevant thing to me so i got riding with this copy pounded out these these emails and the, the the sales letter which ended up being 12 pages in microsoft word it ended up on a on a website so it's not 12 pages of website but uh, in Microsoft Word it was. I sent it off. I was pretty exhausted. I was getting four or five hours of sleep each night with one or two wake-ups from either the two-year-old or the five-year-old. For some reason, the five-year-old still ends up in our bed most nights. So that was interesting. I remember one night with an arm over my head, the, the five-year-old's arm waking me up like, dang it, I still had one more hour to sleep. <laughs> um, but life happens even when you're on a crunch time, right? Right. So um, I sent in the letter on Wednesday and I had this kind of sigh of relief. And about an hour later, I got this like emergency text from, from Ray Edwards. The barn is on fire. I need your help. I'm like what's going on? So I had fin recently finished uh, an agency project 
for him, he recently started his own copywriting agency and he brings in some of his certified copywriters to sort of have a team effort with these big launches. And the launch that was currently underway, which actually is finishing, I think, tomorrow. Um, so I can't say who it is or give you samples of the copy or anything. Um, there were some big problems. The, the marketing team at that company, they've been quite a challenge. They, they just don't like anything. Like, did we try the soft approach to see if that will work for them? And then it didn't convert. So we come back and say, well, we kind of warned you of that. Here we go. Let's hear some new copy that's more not necessarily shock effect, but attention getting, right? And they hated that. So they were pretty ticked off. Had called Ray and the other agency people and were screaming for blood. So he asked me to hurry and write a bunch of new stuff. So let's see, I've got the list here. So on Wednesday, a lot of this was JV emails. So I wrote three new emails uh, for the JV, the, the initial JV email but they wanted to have five or six options for headlines for each email. Okay. So I, I pounded each of those out, sent them off to Ray, he loved them. And I, I sort of asked permission first. I was like, can I, can I pull out my full Ben settle? Like, can I go all, all the way? And he said, yep. And so I sent my screenshot of Ben's schema book and said, okay, here we go. And Ray loved the copy. The client didn't. <laughs> so we had to rewrite again. Uh, let's see. Thursday, I did six more of those same kind of JV emails, each with five subject lines. The fire was still burning. So Friday, they come back and they're freaking out about landing pages, right? Because each of these, this is a big Jeff Walker launch. So we have all the, the PLC videos before the open cart it was like a little workshop, you know, so each of those landing pages, they were just having a cow about. So I helped me and one other copywriter, we kind of rewrote those together. Uh, later, let's see, Saturday, I did nine more emails. These were not the JV. These were for the, um, we did a live cast during open cart week. So they needed three more eels, emails for each live cast. And I had already done those, but I now wrote entirely new ones, each with five subject lines. And then we were getting so nervous about some of the other copy that had been written that we decided to go back and do a bunch of editing to change the voice more like the voice of the new copy we'd written. So that was 13 rewritten emails plus three more landing pages that were fixed. And this is Saturday, right? This, this is the end of a very long week. Right, right. Yes. Okay, so, I mean... I believe you. I hope our listeners believe you. That's still pretty hard to believe that anyone could do that. I, you know, I know you and I, I know was a lot. you just put your nose to the grindstone and you get going. And I also know a little bit about um, your world of music and the, the work ethic and, and the schedule there is actually, it's sort of like good basic training for becoming a copywriter. If, if you can make the switch, right? Right. But, but what did you learn from, from this week, this week from hell? I mean, what, what did you get out of it? Well, at first it was just, I didn't even have my brain on it. It was just go, right? So I, I learned a lot about going. That was not new because I had done that with one of my operas. We had kind of an emergency and I was in this panic attack for a week and basically rewrote my entire hour-long opera in about 10 days, which was ludicrous. Uh, but so I kind of got back into that groove but in a different part of my brain with copywriting so it was sort of like i learned about myself hey i can i can do this i knew i could do it with music and then this was kind of proving to myself with copy that i could do it the second thing i felt almost like something broke inside me not not in a bad way but almost like a cage had broken mm -hmm. or something and my wings had spread a little bit because yeah. i got into this flow state which was another great episode of yours, by the way, in my Garfinkel symphony of podcasts that saved my <laughs> life that week. And th this was sort of the final movement, the flow state, where, which is kind of the result of all the preparation, the intensity of the work. And I got a glimpse of what Bernstein meant, back to Leonard Bernstein, when he was writing West Side Story, he said, uh, what you need to make something brilliant is a great idea and not enough time. 
And that's what, what happened that week. There wasn't enough time, but the opportunity was there. And all of that preparation got me into that flow state. And I was able to just knock it out. I did pretty much collapse the next few days after that and was not much used to man or beast. But um, so th those were, those were big learning things for me. The other thing I learned in the book that I'm writing, uh, which is called rockstar copywriting, yeah. sort of my, my method of how I see through copywriting from a musician's lens and kind of how to simplify copywriting in a, as a hit song sort of thing. I have these four, the book is divided into four stages of like a, a copywriter or a rock star starting from nothing all the way to, you know, a lister kind of thing. So the sections are called the shed where it all begins. Second section is the studio where it starts to develop and the band comes together. Right. And then there's stage three is the circuit. You got to take it on the road and see how, it, how it works. Right. Yeah. And then stage four, the stadium, the big time. So this was very much a crossing of the threshold. It's kind of like my coming of age story, I guess, as a copywriter, I had been spending a lot of time in the shed and I had been in the studio a bit, but this was like that film Bohemian Rhapsody that just came out about Queen, that crazed couple of nights where they rented the studio and put an entire album together in a couple of nights. It was ridiculous, yeah. right? And it was yeah. a big hit. This was that kind of moment where it was pedal to the metal, time to prove myself, can I survive? And hey, I'm still here. <laughs> You're here, and, and, and thanks for coming on and telling us about it now. Let me ask you this. Um, you've had a chance to collapse, rest, regroup. Um, I think you went to a conference, social media conference in San Diego last week. Right. What's your daily, what's different now about your daily routine now that you've been through the trial by fire? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm very much more cognizant of, I can get this done. I, I, I've, seen something in myself of i think my number one kryptonite has been oh i can get that done later mm -hmm. i don't think i'm the only one who has that <laughs> i don't think so i think you're right <laughs> that procrastination but oh I, I can manage that later 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 no no no. so that's kind of those th those shackles of later have come off it's like no i can do this now and so belief in myself just a couple of days ago, I got another call from Ray's team. It's like, hey, we need seven more emails in like two days. Can you do it? And there was, of course, they're paying me for this. And, oh, yeah, seven emails. That's that's nothing. Come on, bring it on, baby. <laughs> so that's it, it, interesting. I'm glad you're sharing it that way. I remember when I first um, got into reading Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone, and they would say, do it now. And, you know, I intellectually construe that, oh, that's just crap. You get stuff done when you get stuff. But no, sometimes do it now is what you got to do. That's so true. And actually, the more you do it now, I mean, you know, you, you do need to think through stuff. It does need to fit in. You don't want to, you do need to look before you leap <laughs> to, to coin a very original phrase. But <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'm really glad you're you're sharing this. So what's what's one piece of advice before we wrap up? What's one piece of advice you would give to the listeners to the podcast, whether they're beginning copywriters, advanced copywriters, or business owners, or just interested? It's sort of in two parts, if that's okay. I'll make it quick. Uh, first, believe trust the stuff you've done. Trust that you've learned enough to make this work and kind of bust through that Stephen Pressfield resistance idea, right? And just go yeah. for it. Yeah. But then a really important thing is the editing afterwards, right? Because I was writing, I was pumping all this stuff out, but that doesn't mean it's any good. Right. So just as I had to have a system for writing it quickly, I also had to have a system for editing it quickly, but with enough precision that I, I was confident in sending it on to the client. So that, Find a way to trust yourself and bust through the resistance and then find a way to be a, have a good quick edit, whether it's a checklist or a, I think Bond Halbert has that pad of paper with all the checks on it. And Paris Lampropoulos has a great checklist. And if I recall, I think one of your podcast episodes, you have some editing stuff. And so I've kind of got all those around my desk here 
I'm sort of double checking. But then I have Hemingway and I have Grammarly. But then for me, really the last, the last backstop is I have to sing it out loud, right? I got to hear my song. Oh, you don't just say it, you actually sing it. No, I don't really sing it, but that was just oh, okay. a metaphor of- But you talk it out loud, that's really I good. I talk it out loud, because I want it to have that conversational, personable cadence and rhythm. That's so good. Yeah, that's my advice. All right, well, I think I think we got to um, call it a wrap. Sounds oh, good. You got to be careful when you say that around Nathan because he might think you're talking oh, about hip hop when you say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just chime in real quick. This has been a, this reminds me of like those old '80s episodes of the of the sitcoms where they go through and they bring up a bunch of previous episodes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's what it felt like. Every time Doug would be like, oh, and then this episode, I was like, I remember that. I loved that episode. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted to start the segment off by saying previously on Copywriter's <laughs> podcast, but I forgot right. to. <laughs> you reminded me. Thank you, Nathan. Nice. So, Doug, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything that you'd like to promote before we're out of here? Sure. I, I'm in the middle of switching my website from symphoniccopywriting.com to rockstarcopywriting.com. Uh, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be fully up. And right on the homepage there, I have a, a little email blueprint of a kind of a, my own checklist of what I've been learning, how to edit myself, as I've made available as a lead magnet. So you can go to rockstarcopywriting.com and check that out if you like. Nice. All right. A fantastic episode, David. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so much. And until next time, you can get more episodes over at copywriterspodcast.com. And we'll catch you next time. Catch you next time. Thanks.